Sunbury was undoubtedly the progenitor of the big day out. Yeah. It, um, it set up festivals like Narara uh, in the 80s. But Sunbury was a child of its time and I don't think it could ever be repeated. John Fowler and Peter Evans, welcome to the Australian Music Vault. John, could you tell me first up, what were the Sunbury festivals? The idea came about because Australian music was very hard to get off the ground and the festival, the idea of the festival was get a lot of young people together so they could hear Australian bands on Australia Day. That was the prime object of it, to promote Australian music, which there was very little of it at the time. Originally, uh, we used to run dances for young people uh, who didn't have the opportunity except to listen to the radio and didn't get much Australian music at the time. And we used to run dances in Mornington uh, with all of the top groups because they never saw the top groups. Lardy Dars, uh, Billy Thorpe, Chain, uh, groups like that, groups that had powerful movement, powerful music, and the kids loved it. Uh, Peter, of course, Peter, Peter knows about them uh, because he came down and did the lighting for them, which they'd never seen before. They'd never seen the, the type of things that the city kids could see. Well, the idea for, for rock festivals really originated in America in the late 60s uh, with uh, probably Monterey Pop and then Woodstock. And the film of Woodstock and the albums, wide album sales, made a big impression, I think, in Australia. And it wasn't long before the festival idea was transplanted here. Now, I went to Wallachia, which was a festival outside of Sydney in 1971, and uh, I came back, I was working for John in the Channel 9 lighting department. And we were up in the videotape department setting up some lights for, a, for something and I was raving to John about what a good time I'd had and what, how great the music was. And he said rather disparaging, why would anyone want to run something like that? And I said, 15,000 kids times $5. And this strange look came over his face. And I think it was at that point that uh, the Sunbury Festivals were actually born. Well, I think the prime thing was to try and find a suitable site. That was something that took quite some time. Uh, we originally thought about Mornington down on the Mornington Peninsula, but there was a lot of ill feeling down that way about having thousands of kids on the properties not knowing what might happen. Uh, just like today, I suppose, there was a concern about certain things, drugs and alcohol, and it was through the Young Farmers League that we actually found, or I didn't, but the person concerned found a suitable farm for the site. A friend of ours was actually involved and we were talking about uh, did he, did he know, because he belonged to the farmers and he travelled around, did he know of anywhere where we might be able to hold uh, an event, a music event? And uh, by sheer good fortune, he found the Duncans. Wonderful people. I met first met George um, and his wife, Beryl. Um, they were wonderful people. They loved young people around, around them. They had a young family and uh, we got talking and it, it, it evolved through them. They were willing to grant the use of their land providing we did cert certain things and the whole thing uh, evolved with their consent. Shortly after um, John found out where the site was, I went out to have a look with him. Uh, now, he had 20 minutes of Super 8 film that I'd shot at Wallachia the year before, so that was used as a basis of the 
what are we looking for when we lay out the site? And I was there on the day that the site for the stage was chosen. I thought it was a wonderful site. It was a natural amphitheatre, with a range of hills up behind the stage, a long grassy slope leading down to the stage and nice flats on either side on the creek bank where you could have stalls and emergency services, etc. So, yeah, it was a wonderful site. And up on the top of the hill, there was ample car parking. There were two sets of roads leading to the site. So, really, it had everything going for it. There was a great deal of prejudice against holding festivals in Victoria. Uh, there'd only been one other attempt. Uh, Sunbury was the, the next one. Uh, and I think it was really the establishment of Melbourne that was afraid of the festival. Other festivals had caused problems for authorities and Sir Henry didn't want to see one in Victoria. And the tool to do that was to get the CFA to argue that the site was a fire risk. Now, the Sunbury CFA Brigade disagreed with that and it was really the captain of that brigade that helped to save the festival by appearing on the nightly news and saying that there wasn't a fire risk. Now, Jackson's Creek uh, acted as a fire break from any fire that would come in from the north. Uh, all of the site had been mown, the grass was only inches of high, inches high. Anyone who knew anything about grass fires would look at that site and say, there's no real fire danger here. So I believe that the CFA ads were really a subterfuge to try and get the festival stopped. The late 60s and early 70s were a time of great cultural change. You had a whole generation of baby boomers growing up with independent ideas you had military conscription, um, mm -hmm. a divisive war in Vietnam, a rift between young people and the police, uh, and a general feeling of rebellion um, in a state which was virtually an autocracy uh, run by Sir Henry Balty and Sir Arthur Ryla. And we must remember that we're at this point only mere months out from the election of a Whitlam government Mm. Um, and the handing over of control to Sir Richard Hamer. So it was in fact a time of great change um, and that was a, a very big part of the Sunbury Festivals. Uh, when they developed in the USA, there was a big ethos of um, peace, love and brown rice um, and that was right on the cusp of change when Sunbury was first mooted. And as the Sunbury festivals went on for the four years that they did run, there was a big change. The ethos of peace, love and brown rice disappeared and was replaced with um, Billy Thorpe's mantra of suck more piss and hallucinogens were uh, replaced with alcohol as the stimulus of choice. But there was also a revolution in Australian music at the same time. A radio airplay ban in 1970 um, shut out many of the older um, pop um, artists and you had a new generation of young entrepreneurial band managers and bands who were starting to sell records based on um, live performances rather than airplay. So it was a period of... of of, of intense change. Now, you couldn't run a Sunbury Festival today because the ethos has changed. It was a creature of its time and I don't think it would ever be repeated. My real involvement was to do the stage lighting for the first three years. Now, I was working for John at the time at Channel 9 and a lot of the pre-production of the Sunbury festivals occurred in control rooms and on the studio floor and breaks in production where we'd talk about festivals and what sort of things needed to be done. The thing that I think distinguishes the Sunbury festivals from all other Australian festivals and the fact that it was a success and it did run for four years was the organisation behind it. Now, previous festivals have been run essentially by 
a bunch of hippies with a, a good idea in a spare paddock. Sunbury was the first Australian festival to be run by entertainment professionals and not only entertainment professionals but mature-aged entertainment professionals. Now, there's a tension here between what these festivals were supposed to represent, counterculture, and what the reality was, was commercialism. If they were to be repeated, they had to make money. Um, and I think Sunbury trod that fine line between counterculture and commercialism extremely well, but it can all be really put down to the level of organisation that lay behind it. The the big thing uh, about the festival was getting the bands, the popular bands, that they were basically Australian, although one or two that we had were New Zealanders, but we won't hold that against them. Also, all the mechanics of the festival, because one of the things that we learnt from other festivals, that they didn't have the right amount of toilets or showers or creature comforts, you might say, uh, although they were rough and ready, but nonetheless they were provided. Water was another thing. There was plenty of drinking water, um, all those sort of things, and that, that was a, a pretty big effort. But I've got to say this, that eventually uh, some friends of ours got together and they became the nucleus of the festival committee. Um, there were the... Uh, people that ran the security, Bob Jones, there were the solicitors that uh, did a brilliant job in dealing with government matters, um, whereas I took the overall role of seeing what was happening and making sure that everything was arranged so that the festival could run well. My involvement with Sunbury was largely limited to the stage area. Now, I knew everything that had gone on beforehand from John because we talked about it quite often in the studios. What I didn't realise was some of the behind the scenes efforts. Someone who hasn't been mentioned so far is John's solicitor, Graham Rees-Jones. Now, without Graham, I don't believe that the Sunbury festivals would have worked as well as they did. His was the keen legal mind that actually got the permissions um, and overcame the obstructions uh, that were placed in the way of Sunbury Festival. And I think John would agree that that Graham's contribution was critical, um, as was that of John's wife, Rosemary, who looked after all the commercial arrangements, and John Dixon, who actually oversaw the, um, the festival management operations on site. I think the thing that most people wouldn't realise was that large part of the Sunbury Festivals were run by the Australian Army. Volunteers from that regiment looked after all sorts of things at Sunbury, security, catering, uh, assistance with the stage, uh, management of the traffic on the road up and down to the stage, um, passes, um, collecting money and getting it to the central area, all of those sorts of things without which the festival couldn't have run. It was not done in army time. It was done in their own time and paid for by Odessa, but the Army would have seen this as a hugely valuable training exercise and they made an enormous contribution to the festival. That even the police uh, were instructed to take things easy at the festival because the police weren't all that popular with young people at that stage and it was very important that everybody, even our own security people, through Bob Jones, who wore special shirts depicting a peaceful sort of emblem. Uh, the, everybody was involved in making sure that everybody had a, a good time. That was extremely important. The early 1970s were an incredible time in Melbourne. Melbourne was the live music capital of Australia. There were dancers in every town hall. Bands were playing three to five gigs a night, just moving from one to the other in, uh, in panel vans and old transit vans. Um, and it was really very vibrant. Um, there was a huge number of um, 
dancers in the inner city, inner city and an equal number out in the suburbs. Um, and the live bands really were the best in, in Australia at that point. Now, in looking back at that period, I think that that really contributed to Sunbury. I don't think Sunbury could have been held anywhere else. Sunbury mightn't have been, mightn't have conceived pub rock, but I think it was certainly the midwife at its birth. Um, there were beer barns all over Melbourne with three or four big rock acts a night. Mm. Um, uh, there were dancers like the one that John was running in Mornington called Odessa, for which I was lucky enough to be invited to do the lighting. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that, that set the scene for Sunbury. Michael Ganitsky, yes, well, he was involved in Sunbury, but he was just like anybody else, any other agency. He did have some of the top bands that we needed at that festival, but there was also uh, Michael Chug, there was Spirit, uh, quite a number of other agencies also that had artists that needed to appear at Sunbury. And when the other Sunburys were born, they had to be there. That was the whole thing about the musicians. They had to be at Sunbury because that kept them going for the rest of the year. At the first Sunbury Festival, the king of the hill was Billy Thorpe. He was louder. He was more in your face. Um, I think Lobby Lloyd summed it up best when he said that uh, when Billy opens his mouth, he doesn't ask, he commands. And if he says, clap your hands, you clap your hands. And if he says, sing, you sing. But country radio were incredibly popular. Um, Mississippi, which later formed in, morphed into the Little River Band, uh, Jeff Duff and Cush, uh, La Di Da's, uh, Carson, Chain, uh, Bakery, which was a Perth band. Yeah. Uh, so really there were bands from all over Australia at, at Sunbury and uh, yeah, it, it, too many to list. I think the first Sunbury was the closest to being the peace, love and brown rice um, that overseas festivals had been in which, in fact, the first festival in Australia, Arimba in 1970, had been very close to that ideal. However, over the, um, over the four years of the festivals, the crowds changed quite a bit. Um, the first year you could smell um, dope all over the festival site. Mm. There was no need for the police to have sniffer dogs, even if they'd had them then. Um, and yes, there was a lot of um, uh, hallucinogenic substances of one kind or another. But there were a huge range of people there, um, hippies, skinheads, bikies, young people. There were a surprising number of children at Sunbury. People had babies there. Uh, there were, I saw, you know, kids who were five or six years old. And throughout the crowd, there were a number of um, older people as well. Uh, so it really was quite diverse. Most people were there just to have a good time. There was very little problem. And the police were most complimentary about uh, the behaviour of the crowd. Over the four years, the emphasis gradually moved more and more towards alcohol, uh, I think to the detriment of the festival. Gradually the scene did change. There were more males there than females. Uh, in, the, I think, of the third year. That's where it did sort of change and it was starting to get into a beer stage. So we thought we'd change the style of the festival to a certain extent and we introduced different features. For instance, we did have the uh, part of the Channel 9 Orchestra take part with one of the bands there to perform a, a, a rock musical type of thing. And... Um, the style of music was changing and we could see that coming so we introduced what was called then a second stage. And the second stage was a, 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 a quite a change to the festival because you had two types of people there, those that wanted the rock and roll and nothing else or those that wanted a mixture of rock and roll and 
uh, jazz and uh, dance and stuff like that. And by the second year, or this would have been in 75, uh, we, we needed an o- well, it brought the contentious part about we needed an overseas act. And funnily enough, Michael Gadinsky was one of the ones that uh, really affirmed that we needed a, an overseas act to show what was going on, rightly or wrongly. Uh, we used Queen in 74, 74, I think it was, and then we used uh, Deep Purple in 75 because it was attracting a different crowd. Queen was a different kind of music and we had the word from England that they were going to be the biggest band in the land, which obviously we all know that they were at that stage. By 75, they were really big. Uh, so over those three years, there was a distinct change in both the patronage the type of people. Numbers had uh, decreased a little, but that was going through a trial stage. We wanted to see what was going to happen and hopefully it would build up from the second stage and the overseas acts. Well, the first Sunbury Festival was uh, televised by Channel 7, which may seem strange (laughs) seeing it was run largely by Channel 9 personnel, but Channel 9 had knocked it back and Channel 7 took it up. The first year was also made into a film. Now, one of the people who were involved in running the Sunbury's, John Dixon, was the director of Cambridge Films, and he produced the film of the the first festival, which is now available on DVD. Unfortunately, not all the bands could be in it because it was difficult to get um, everyone's um, uh, agreement as to, you know, what rights were owned by whom, but it's probably still the best ever record of what went on at a Sunbury Festival. By 74, television stations had lost interest. The festivals were no longer um, um, the rude and naughty drug-ridden thing that everyone had uh, thought that they would be and sensationalist press were no longer really interested in it. Molly Meldrum was employed by Cambridge to act to do the interviews for the film version of Sunbury 72. Now at that stage, Molly was virtually an unknown. He was a writer for Go Set um, and that was about probably the greatest extent as as to how he was known. So if you were a reader of Go Set, you knew who Molly Meldrum was, the wider public wouldn't. Now Molly has, has stated on several occasions that without Sunbury, there never would have been a countdown. And countdown was what really made Molly, a household name. Molly did all the Cambridge interviews uh, and I think he did a very good job being the the same age as most of the uh, festival attendees was probably a big help. Um, He would have felt more trusted than if um, some more, uh, 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 some older person had been there doing the interviews. And I think he managed to extract people's feelings about what they, they thought they were going to see at the festival and, uh, and also at the end of it, how they felt about it. Johnny O'Keefe's management had given me instructions that there were to be no flashing lights, there were to be no coloured lights, right. there was to be nothing on the screen behind him. So Johnny O'Keefe walked out in a white suit, yeah. in a bland lighting existence. I was standing no more than three metres from him at the lighting console. He was visibly trembling. And then the crowd started booing. They didn't want to hear Johnny O'Keefe. And I was in the uh, police officer's tent at the time, just checking on what had been going on around the festival. And you could have dropped a pin in there. They just heard the crowd booing and get off, you know, get off, boo, we don't want to hear that sort of music. And uh, they thought there was going to be a riot. Mm. We launched into his first song. I think it was one song and he had that crowd. Um, he, he launched into some of his traditional rock and roll songs. The band he had behind him wasn't something that was going to blast anybody off the hill. 
but I think his sheer showmanship. Johnny O'Keefe came from the school where the performer was everything and he relied totally on his stage presence to win that crowd over and by gee, it worked. And Lobby Lloyd said, you know, there are some guys who are rock and roll stars. They mightn't have the best voices in the world. They mightn't have the best looks in the world, but when they walk on stage, they take control. And that's all I can say about Johnny O'Keefe. He walked out on that stage and he took control. And I think he challenged Billy Thorpe at that festival for the title of King of the Hill. Yeah. And that was the rebirth of Johnny O'Keefe. There was no doubt about that. In 1975, ACDC were scheduled to appear after Deep Purple. Now, Deep Purple had veto rights over who was to appear before and after them. The band before them was Jeff Duff and Cush, uh, which were, you know, a different sort of band to Deep Purple. And the veto rights extended for 30 minutes after Deep Purple's performance. So that meant no one could come on after Deep Purple for 30 minutes. However, ACDC's roadies rushed up on stage and started plugging into Deep Purple's back line as soon as Deep Purple went off. And then when ACDC's drum kit appeared on stage, Deep Purple's roadies, who were professional boxers, stepped in. Now, th at this point, it should have been left to stage management to sort out, but it wasn't. Uh, and a fracas ensued between uh, uh, Deep Purple's roadies and ACDC's roadies. I believe that fists were at least raised, if not actually exchanged, uh, between the two sets of roadies. Uh, but um, apparently ACDC then refused to go on, and I don't know why, because Deep Purple's drummer, uh, Ian Pace, later said in a television interview that Angus Young was in tears. He was only age 16, had not been able to play at Australia's largest festival. The only person that could answer the question as why ACDC didn't go on would be Michael Browning, their manager. Now, he was pressing to get ACDC on uh, straight after Deep Purple uh, so that um, they could capitalise on the momentum built by Deep Purple. Um, why he chose to do that in the face of um, Deep Purple's veto, I don't know. Uh, I think there was a, a big rumpus about the fee that was paid to Deep Purple. They were a top English band, they were top of what they were doing. A lot of Australian bands didn't believe that we should have it, but once again I'd go back and say that it was agreed by a very top management team that we should have an international band. And we thought, well, if we're going to go for one, we'll go for the big one which we did. We missed out on the rain insurance by a few points. Uh, that, that meant that the company was not in a very good financial situation at the end of the 1975 and unfortunately that was the end of it. But a lot of people blamed the fact that we'd uh, taken Deep Purple on board and I think a lot of, there was a lot of ill feeling about that. But that wasn't the case. It was, it was purely and simply a rain situation. In fact, um, 3XY, that was the only station playing rock and roll of any description at the time, kept saying, oh, don't bother going to Sunbury this year, it's raining. And we had to keep ringing them and telling them not to keep saying that because it wasn't raining at Sunbury. It had been and it was a bit of a mud bath but uh, 3XY had a lot to do with the failure, I think, at that time, and I, I mean that quite sincerely. Deep Purple, I think, had been unfairly blamed for being the end of Sunbury. If it hadn't rained, they would have been an inspired choice and the festival might still be going in one form or another. I thought their performance was excellent. Now, they would bought a lot of equipment with them, yeah. um, they doubled the size of the PA system. They had uh, 600 kilograms of dry ice um, to create fog where an Australian band might use 60 kilograms. Um, 
And I thought their performance was, uh, was very competent, but I don't think it would have eclipsed the Australian bands. No. Um, but, yes, if it hadn't rained, they would have been an inspired choice. Well, I think, John, okay. you're right in, in that the Deep Purple were contractually to be paid up front, which you can imagine coming out with all that equipment uh, to the other side of the world, you would want some guarantee that you're going to be paid. So I think that was probably quite reasonable. Um, but it wasn't their fault that the festival failed. It was the problem with the rain. Deep Purple some years later um, toured Australia. Now the Musicians Union and the Australian Theatrical and Amusement Employees Association objected to that tour on the basis that they were people likely to cause industrial unrest. At that time, the Australian Prime Minister was Bob Hawke, former ACTU chief. And uh, Deep Purple volunteered to put their hands in their own pockets and they paid union fees, which was about $30 per musician, to all of the Australian acts that had um, appeared at Sunbury. Um, that money didn't come from the government, that money came from Deep Purple. That's my understanding. That's the way it was reported in the press. $30 was pretty much a week's wages. So yeah, $30 doesn't sound much now, but it was, you know, a reasonably substantial amount. Less than they would have got if they had been paid the agreed rate with a promoter, but better than nothing. I'd like to add to that that all the Australian bands for four years had been t paid top wages to appear at the festival. You couldn't get a band to appear for a normal gig that they would do. They all wanted big money to go on the festival. Sunbury was an important part of the yearly calendar. Before the first Sunbury, band bookings might extend a couple of weeks into the future. After that first Sunbury, most bands were booked eight weeks solid. Um, Sunbury ushered in proper contracts for bands. Mm. So it had a very big effect on the Australian music industry and an appearance at Sunbury guaranteed album sales and live work. The first two Sunburys were recorded and the first Sunbury released a double album of various artists. There was a double album recorded by Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs and anyone who listened to music had that album at home. And when I spoke to Gil Matthews, he still thinks it was the best album that they ever recorded. Perhaps the most successful album was 1973, the Mushroom Triple Album, which was the first album to go gold, triple album to go gold in Australia. And, and really it, 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 it has to be put down to Michael Gadinsky's tenacity to put out such an adventurous all-Australian album. The women at the Sunbury Festival would have included Margaret Road Knight, Linda George, backing singers The Cookies, um, Denise Drysdale, uh, and they were definitely a presence, but Australian rock and roll at that stage was still very much male dominated and the type of music for which Sunbury became famous was also very much male dominated. But yes, there were uh, women performers there and they were some great women performers. If anyone who's ever heard Wendy Saddington sing the blues or Renee Gayer sing blues tinged uh, uh, jazzy rock, uh, will know that these are two women uh, to be reckoned with. Uh, the second stage was really a big change at the festival because it was bringing music together, uh, in particular more women. And it, I suppose really it was an escape for people that liked a bit of rock, rock and roll, but they liked other music as well. In fact, we also had the Austra Australian Ballet Company do a performance at the, uh, at the second stage. And that was what we were trying to do, was do a whole mixture of things that would bring more women into the, into the festival itself. 
because it was a do- it was dominated by the male sing- male rock and roll. It, that's how it all started to change. I don't know where it would have finished up. Well, the first <clears throat> MCs at the Sunbury Festivals were Adrian Rawlins and Jerry Humphreys. Now they were the backbone of comparing uh, Australian festivals almost from the from the start. Adrian Rawlins was a beat poet and very counterculture. Um, and he was also a co-promoter of a couple of festivals, Arimba in New South Wales and Wallachia in New South Wales. Jerry Humphreys was the former frontman from The Loved Ones and a very good compare as well. Now, in 73, John went a bit out on a limb, we all thought, in... Uh, getting Paul Hogan to compare the show. I doubt if there'd be many Australians who haven't seen Crocodile Dundee. Now, the star of that was Paul Hogan. Paul Hogan started out as a rigger on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and he uh, entered a talent contest on Channel 9 called New Faces with a knocker character. That was later taken up by Mike Willisey on A Current Affair and he would do small satire pieces at the end of uh, uh, a program a week. Now, John in 1973 decided that Paul Hogan would make a good compare. I'm not sure that Paul was so certain of this because on his way to the stage, he was reputedly um, terribly nervous and he got flashed by a male punter and that would have put him off even more. But uh, he soon recovered his composure and I think he made a, um, a good contribution. Paul Hogan was introducing acts, for instance, Johnny O'Keefe. He um, introduced as Jimmy O'Keefe, who won the talent quest down the pub last week, and he's raw and he's nervous, so give him a bit of a go. So it was it was sort of satirical. I must admit I was a bit flabbergasted at John's choice, but in 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 fact, in the end, I think it was an inspired one. The man who was in charge of policing at at Sunbury was a very enlightened individual, uh, Mick Miller, who later held the post of of Chief Commissioner of Victorian Police with great um, distinction. Now, I'd pestered John for a ride in the helicopter. John said, yeah, be up the top of the plateau at two o'clock and you can have a ride. So... I sat down and smoked a joint and then I had another joint and then I had another joint and got myself ready for the helicopter ride. Turned up at the top of the hill, there's two spare seats in the helicopter. In the other seat, Mick Miller. And I went straight into paranoia. You'll know I'm stoned, you'll know I'm stoned, you'll know I'm stoned. (laughs) But during that, when I interviewed him um, for the book some years later, He said that on that flight, he saw that an eyeful was much better than an earful and that that flight actually sent him out to buy the first police helicopter. So the foundation of the police air wing was at the the, uh, first Sunbury Festival. We did fly over the whole festival site, but one of the amazing things was that pilots who were landing at Tullamarine would deliberately detour over the site. So you'd be sitting at the front of the stage and all of a sudden this jet would go whoosh over your head. So it was, yes, it was sightseeing. Look at the hippies down there. (laughs) At the first Sunbury, John had problems with people sneaking in and it was compounded by uh, the farmer of the hill above the stage who was letting people in through his property. And what they do is they try and sneak down the hill at night They'd be stopped by security during the day, but they thought at night they had a free go. Now, John had a searchlight on top of the hill and that was used to pick people out. And between acts, we used the stage follow spots for the same thing. So I'm not sure a lot got in that way, but some did get in. But there were other ways into the festival. Now, one of the Fowler children saw one of the water tankers pull into the festival. The water tanks had to be regularly replenished so water was trucked into the site. Well, the tanker stopped and out poured about 20 young people who'd all paid the tanker driver, you know, 
a small amount of money to get them into the site. Um, and uh, thereafter, the tankers were always checked before they came in the gate. Well, I'm amazed that there hasn't been a book on Sunbury before. It was such an important event in Australian rock music history. It set up Australian bands and Australian music for Australians. It was the start of us no longer being ashamed of the homegrown product. There was no cultural cringe anymore. It was the Whitlam years. Everyone was proud to be an Australian. We had a resurgence of all of the Australian arts. We had Patrick White winning a Nobel Prize for literature. We had Jermaine Greer's The Female Eunuch, the films of Peter Weir. We had plays by David Williamson at the Pram Factory. All sorts of things were going on in the Australian arts and I think Sunbury was a part of that. There has been over the years so much misinformation and a lot of people who I think have claimed credit for which they're not really due. I set out to try and set the story straight. Now, for many years I've worked as a historian, so I've tried hard to keep my own biases out of the book. I've relied on the City of Hume archives, the archives held here that John donated, and a vast oral history project. I recognise that the people who were at or were involved in Sunbury are not getting in younger. Most of us are grandparents now. And I was concerned to try and capture as much of people's memories as I could. And that's why I set out on the Oral History Project. Now, the book has grown out of those things. I hope I've set the record straight. I've been a very lucky man. <clears throat> I was, when the first Sunbury was on, I was only 22. It was my first big outdoor gig. First time I'd employed anyone, and it was a huge adventure. I've been lucky enough to have been mentored, mentored through my career by good people. John Fowler was one of those, mentored me in, in uh, the lighting department. I learned a lot off John. And I've been lucky enough to work all of my life in the entertainment industry. Uh, there's not many people who managed to do that. So yes, I'm, I'm very pleased. For a long time, like John, I forgot about Sunbury. It was just something that I did in my past. It was only around the 40th anniversary that I spoke to John about the need to set the record straight that I really started to consider what my part in it and what Sunbury had meant uh, to the music scene at the time and in fact to the music scene of today. After Sunbury, people who went to concerts etc wanted more comfort, proper seating, um, shade, all of those sorts of things because the ethos had changed. Uh, but Sunbury was undoubtedly the progenitor of the big day out. Yeah. It um, set up festivals like Narara uh, in the 80s but Sunbury was a child of its time and I don't think it could ever be repeated. So yes, I'm proud of what I managed to do. I'm very grateful for John for allowing me to be a part of the Sunbury legend. And if the book that I've written goes some way towards explaining just how important John was to Sunbury, then I think I've done my job. Thank you, Peter. All in all, it's the memories of uh, Sunbury. Uh, it did something and that's what I'm proud of is the fact that Sunbury achieved uh, what it set out to achieve was to produce Australian music on Australia Day so that all of Australia could take part in it one way or another.